Well, data centers, they're facing a crunch, aren't they? They've got complexity, they've got problems with latency, they've got problems with too many servers, if you like, physical servers, they've got lots of traffic, lots of applications, um, a number of networking protocols and physical uh, layers, and they're, all, they're in need of more speed, and all of this costs money. So, can the network cope? Well, traditional, traditional networks use decentralized switches, with data planes and control planes on the same physical hardware. So the question is, is OpenFlow the answer to this? Well, obviously, these guys think so. They're all in favor. We'll find out a bit more about that in a minute. What they're, what they're proposing is that you have a centralized managed controller um, with OpenFlow data plane switches, uh, of which we've been talking about a bit now. And I've got a bit of a diagram that perhaps brings this a bit more to life uh, in a moment. Um, and this, this technology has the potential to automate configuration, to improve network uh, efficiency, to reduce the total cost of ownership, as uh, Mark's been talking about. But the question is, can they do it? Because the data center switch market has an awful lot of inertia in it. There's $6 billion worth of uh, equipment every year sold into the data, net, data center networking market. Vendors have been consolidating, and at the moment, uh, the last figures that Gartner had, and these figures are all from Gartner, is that the top three vendors had 82% of the port shipments. That's a lot of control in one place. It's a lot of inertia in the market. So, um, in the service provider market, you have $13 billion worth of equipment sold every year, and the top four have 85% of the market. So, in this context, what can the future of software-defined networking be? Can OpenFlow have enough momentum? Or will these proprietary boxes continue to rule? Because effectively what this means is, these sorts of numbers mean, is that you don't have a lot of turnover of, a net of networking equipment, either in the data center or in the service provider market. Um, I'll skip through those because I think this is... Just very briefly, this came from the Open Network Foundation. Um, this is a diagram that kind of gives you a bit of an idea of what this is all about. Uh, and I found this quite a, quite a helpful diagram. At the moment, what you have, um, as I understand it, and these guys will correct me if I'm wrong, because these guys know far more about it than I do, um, is that each switch obviously has all these things in one place. The custom hardware, the operating system that runs the switch, and the features that run on top of that. The theory is, at the moment, the operating, as from the SDN point of view, is that the network operating system, as it transitions, will move to become centralized. And then finally, you'll get the features moving off the custom hardware. And all these, all these the hardware will become is basically, effectively, as I described them, dumb boxes, something that Mark disagrees with. So in that context, let me ask, first of all, um, uh, I asked you, Mark, whether or not this is, this is a land grab to try and push Cisco out of, the, uh, out of its current huge dominance of the, uh, of the networking market. Uh, would you guys agree from Dell and from NEC? Keep, keep talking, they'll turn Good the, they'll turn the, the mic up. Uh, I don't think we see this as a land grab. I, what we see is the change in the community. The, the community is changing. The customers are asking for more openness. They're asking for more open standards. They're asking for the ability to um, more interop with other uh, products. Whereas with HP, uh, Dell also wants to provide you an end-to-end -end solution. And we believe that um, the issue here is not just um, SDN, which controls the, the, the network plane, but it also has to do with how you control uh, your storage and your and your server. So there's a lot more around this than just this one piece. And we believe that is the orchestration um, that we want to look at. So it's not so much a, a land grab as it is a, a request from the community to uh, be able to be, take existing equipment, uh, look at best of breed products and, and integrating them. And so we have partnerships with other vendors uh, in, in our ecosystem, and how do you integrate with them? That, I think, is, is uh, what the community is asking for. That's Sushi. Yeah, um, 
the current uh, the uh, problem in the data center market is the, uh, for example, the because of the virtualization, uh, software is uh, being increased, and also uh, some of the VLAN limitation. Um, the because of the data center want to have a uh, lot of multi tenancy for the market uh, for the customer, but because of the VLAN number is uh, limit to the 4K 4000, and uh, but the customer want to have more more than 4K because of the flexibility of the control. But current uh, system doesn't su support that. And those kind of are, is our current pain points for the customer. And also, th therefore, they want to ask to the, let's say, dominant vendor like Cisco and Juniper, and please change the current hardware immediately, let's say in a six month. But they have already roadmap, and it's, uh, it's very difficult for, for them to support quickly. And therefore, the why OpenFlow comes uh, is the, uh, the, in order to satisfy the customer requirements as soon as possible, therefore OpenFlow interface would be available for the customer. Then customer can develop on the uh, customization software by themselves. That is a main, not a main, but the initial motivation for the at OpenFlow comes. And therefore, if we have a, such a kind of standard interface in hardware and software, then even if the vendor could not provide some of the function, then maybe user itself or user can ask to the software vendor to, to customize on the kind of software. That, that is my assumption. Atsushi, thank you. Um, Mark, just um, both Bruce and Atsushi have talked about customer requirements, customer driven. And we all know that actually if you ask a customer what they want, um, they don't actually know what they want. They kind of know what they know what they don't want. They know what their problem is. But are they are customers actually asking for this? Yes, I believe they are. I believe they are. Um, again, as we talked about some of the issues addressing the uh, network administrator, um, the the. The, the error-prone nature of managing devices one by one is clearly no longer acceptable, especially in the speed it takes to deploy new applications in today's enterprise. And so that's definitely a driver. Um, automating the infrastructure, making the network requirements um, um, cohesive with the systems administrator is another key important area. Okay, um, question for Bruce, migration. As I said, there's a lot of inertia in, in the market. There's a lot of, uh, also a lot of inertia within data centers, whether they're owned by service providers, whether they're owned by enterprises. Basically, you don't change your network switches that much. So this is a whole new paradigm, if you like, I guess. Um, how are you going to get from here to there? I, you know, we believe it's going to be a s slow roll. Just as virtualization, I think we said VMware started in the early 90s, and now we are virtualized 50%, so that's 10 years we've only gone 50%. We still see the same thing will happen uh, in the uh, network virtualization, uh, which SDN is part of. Um, so we'll start to see slow changes. We'll start to see people doing testing. Uh, and originally, a lot of the uh, uh, SDN open flow was for academics to do um, testing of networks. And you'll start to see that. You'll start to see migration. But there will be changes there are other four or five factors in a network, um, and this is with, with the 10 gig end-to-end um, uh, -end solutions coming. You'll see a lot of need for people or for data centers to change. Uh, power consumption uh, costs going up, you'll see a need. So we, we see that the, there will be change, and, but we also see that it'll, it will take time. Uh, the issue will come not so much from a technology point of view, but come from a financial point of view that uh, data center owners will want to reduce their OPEX. And by spending a little bit on CapEx, you can reduce your OPEX. And when you make that change, then you're going to be looking for products that support the new technologies, the OpenFlow, um, OpenStack, um, and that kind of products. So that's kind of where we see it happening. Uh, it'll, take, it'll take a few years. There's also a cultural issue. I'm a three-tier. Um, you know, networking guy from 1995. Um, I was, I grew up in that era. So that's kind of what I'm used to. And, and we, we start to say now, well, and I'm a CLI guy. So you said, the end, Mark said it's the end of the CLI. Well, 
that's kind of what we see, you know, the change. The next generation network operator will be more about the business side, not the 4 a.m. CLI side. And, and that's really where we see the change happening in the more sophisticated the network. And, and the other reason why you're going to see change is it's really complex now. And as complex as it is, humans can't do it in time. So we need tools that will allow us to do it. That's yeah, she. Yeah. The, um, in addition to the, uh, the previous uh, comments, the, uh, the actually uh, currently, as, as, as we know, the, the server is now virtualized. And because of the virtualization, the uh, server side of the network, is especially for topographic switch, and also some of the aggregation switch, needs uh, the virtualization aware switches. And also, the uh, network should be a flattened network. Flattened meaning that uh, we would have layer two flat network in as a whole network. That kind of capability is necessary in a data center network. Therefore, that part is easy um, from a current network to the open flow enable network, and then simply attached to the uh, router network. That is first generation of the transition. The another uh, the instrument, instrument would be uh, between a data center. And uh, the, in the last week, Google talked about open flow deployment in uh, their data center, and uh, between a data center. And uh, because of the between a data center, um, they use the lot of uh, one links uh, because of the costly on um, the uh, fiber. Therefore, they want to minimize the the uh, the uh, bits, and therefore do they do the some traffic engineering, how to reduce the traffic, and also how to reduce uh, uh, the uh, uh, do the, some of the uh, traffic control by policing the traffic uh, and the uh, uh, the um, the not prioritized traffic and those kind of thing is the uh, next uh, uh, thing that will be happen in a partially. Therefore, what I mean is the uh, open flow is gradually um, deploying in a server side of the farm and then between the data center. Then finally more than, than right, right now, and that, that is my assumption. And, and I'd like to add a few more things to uh, what's driving change in the data center. So we've talked certainly about cloud applications and virtualization, but there's these other drivers such as big data, Hadoop type environments, the consumerization IT, mobility, that are all now coming together, that together now drive a lot of change. Um, so. So the combination of these things, the need for bandwidth, the need for smart application awareness in the network are the things that are now going to, to cause the data center to transition. Okay, so there's a lot to pick up on there. And I would like to sort of talk about the, um, a lot of the kind of the staff issues as well, because obviously uh, you mentioned, uh, Bruce, you know, you're, a hard, you're a CLI three-tier mm -hmm. sort of guy, and a lot of people like, you know, in data centers are going to be like that. Um, which is obviously no disrespect, and I'm sure that's perfectly good. But where, how are those, how are those people going to have to change the way they do things? And, and, and you also mentioned, and Mark mentioned as well, that you can, um, you, you can make configuration changes much more quickly, which obviously means that you can propagate your mistakes much more quickly. So, you know, what are the people? What's the people angle on this? Mark. Okay, I'll start with that. Um, so first of all, the network engineer has a long time to live. Okay, the network engineer does not go away. His particular job may change here, in which now they concentrate on policy in the network instead of device by device CLI. Um, the other aspects is because the network becomes programmable, that the network engineer potentially takes on a job of programming policy and mating these open APIs to other systems. So there's actually maybe an expansion in the role of the network engineer, not a decline. Uh, yeah, the especially for uh, the 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 country, um, let's say hosting provider, uh, they have to provide uh, uh, the service as soon as possible, and uh, kind of there are lots of uh, web service, and then you, you can click it, then you can get a service, um, that kind of thing. But uh, in reality, it, it is not uh, fully deployed yet, and uh, therefore they want to, especially for data center people, want to have one person as a, uh, the the uh, who can orchestrate everything, 
And therefore, especially for networking area, uh, we need a kind of a, like uh, orchestration tool uh, to quickly uh, change this. Yeah. Okay, first. Yeah. I see a couple things here. First, you're going to start to see changes in the network. We're flattening the network. We, we call it distributed core, uh, where, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, but what's going to happen is the guy who knows how to do the network is your biggest asset. And he will be the one, or she will be the one who write your templates, who write your scripts, who builds that. In data centers in the past, it's usually three or four in a small data center, two or three people who really, really understand the data center and what the concept and what the business needs. And then you have 10 or 15 or hundreds of people who kind of follow. And what we can do now is take the knowledge of those core people and get them to write the scripts, write the templates, uh, and then the team can test them. And that's kind of see where you, you People, network engineers won't go away because in the end, they still have to understand virtualization. You have to understand uh, OSPF, BGP, and all of these uh, other uh, technologies. So the difference will be how you use them, where you might use them at a higher level uh, and conceptual level and, and understanding uh, how the network is driven. Okay, um, let's talk a bit about what the network has to do, the kind of stuff it's carrying. Um, yes, we've talked about applications, but it also involves, uh, as we touched on a bit earlier when we were discussing this over breakfast, things like storage. Now, I mean, storage networks have traditionally been completely separate from the rest of the, the data center network, but the way things are going, slowly but surely, is that the storage traffic is going to be carried over the production network, mm -hmm. or at least a pa perhaps a parallel production network. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Where does storage come into this? Um, Atsushi? Yep. The, at least the uh, current open flow um, the supports uh, TCP IP traffic as a uh, budget way. Therefore, especially for IP storage, like a, uh, the NAS network, uh, NAS type of thing is easily accommodated. But the uh, fiber channel type of thing is uh, still needs a time because of the current, as you know, uh, fiber channel has uh, the work for the FCOE type of the work is, is going on. But uh, that type of work needs to change the hardware, like a data center bridging and uh, special hardware required. Therefore, eventually we will have the FCOE, the uh, uh, bridging, DC bridging device, would have open flow capable. Then potentially we could integrate FCOE traffic and open flow in a single chassis. But it still takes take some time. Right now the Current available uh, open flow devices is only supporting IP type of traffic, not FC. Yeah, right yeah so, so, so no block traffic, basically. Yeah, yeah. right, yeah. yeah. Bruce? Yeah, so at, at Dell, we, we definitely agree that uh, we're going to see a change. And we've been announcing today some products, um, uh, some Blade products that will do end to end 10 gig. Uh, and what's going to happen is that change, uh, and those products will su currently support iSCSI, DCB, mm -hmm. uh, FCOE. But what OpenFlow brings is this orchestration question of, yes, OpenFlow orchestrates the network, but you have the other parts that need orchestration. And, and this is where Dell kind of believes that it's bringing in network orchestration, uh, virtualized servers, virtualized storage, and all of that. Now, there won't be any, ch OpenFlow does not, and SDN does not make any changes to the block side, blocks uh, 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 of, the, of the storage but it's how it flows. And as you virtualize and as you move your VMs from switch to switch to data center to data center as, as, your, um, as your controller makes these changes, the network, ha the storage has to go with it and servers have to go with it. So we have to think about a lot more than just how the, the workload goes and, and where the other parts of the application are. Because the application may have a SQL database uh, in Tokyo, whereas the application sits here in Hong Kong. Uh, so this, you may have storage and, and data uh, in a lot of different places. So all of that has to be designed in. Yeah, storage obviously has very unique um, service level requirements. Um, obviously, it has to have lossless nature, um, low latency, high throughput. And so in partitioning a network to carry converged infrastructure, storage, data, 
it's very important that we allocate the network to have those attributes, and it's the introduction of this SDN central control plane which provides a great area to deploy this kind of policy. Okay, so we've talked about storage, we've talked about the network. Um, let's talk about management, because this is going to be key to it all. I think, Mark, in your presentation, you've touched on this. If it's all going to work, if it's all going to be cost effective, then you need one, as you said, one pane of glass to manage the whole thing. But of course, hardware vendors, hardware vendors being who they are, they all have their own proprietary twists on these things, and you will need their management interface to make it all work. Now, obviously, in my data center, I have lots of people's equipment. How is that going to work? Mm -hmm. uh, Mark, yes. Well, I'll go ahead and start this time. So, <laughs> so we're introducing this end-to-end in, 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 in -end control plane through our product that we call IMC. Now, IMC, even though it's a single pane of glass for HP networking, it's actually an open system that manages over 6,000 industry standard devices. So it does provide that robustness across multi-vendor. But the other aspects, is, as we've been talking today, is this degree of openness and integration and APIs into the other orchestration systems, including the hypervisor management or the cloud orchestration layers. I mentioned OpenStack earlier. Same, uh, you know, Dell, we've launched our open network, um, our, our, our OM open network managed network uh, 5.0 tool, which manages not only, uh, uh, so Dell got into the networking business. Uh, Dell had a legacy uh, networking business, and last year it acquired a company called Force 10 Networks. Um, and the, our products now not only manage the Dell legacy products, but the Force 10 products, but third party products. So you asked earlier, you said earlier that it's a dumb switch, and what's the value of a, of a Dell HP um, or of the other vendors, uh, NEC? The, the, the value is in those tools. It's the value is going to be in the extra features that that switch can do and what we can do with that. So there will be things um, those, where the features go up. The ability to do those features still have to be in the switch. So the value will be in our management tools. Our differentiators will be in our management tools and, and our orchestration tools and, and also in the extra features that the, the switches can do. Yeah. Um, I think uh, this is analogy to, uh, let's say, a VMware uh, virtualization machine. The VM can run on the any the um, any uh, the IA compa IA compatible machine, right? Therefore, if the open flow and uh, uh, standard API is available for every device, and then eventually we will have such a kind of hypervisor for network, then those the library or network component can be use everyone to integrate with own type of the management system. And therefore, I, I believe that, uh, let's say, in a few years, everybody can, can integrate with a multiple vendor device as a homogeneous way. That, that is still not right now, but I think that that's a way to go. OK, thank you. Um, questions from the floor? Uh, we have a few. Uh, Amal, uh, I'm going to hold on you for a sec. Um, one at the back there. Was that you, Daniel? Daniel? Yeah, thanks. Uh, Daniel Bardlev from the uh, Metro Ethernet Forum, MEF. Um, at the MEF, we're, uh, we've been working for quite a while on uh, defining carrier Ethernet services, um, where service providers and, and businesses, enterprises can uh, define for each other um, an end-to-end -end service in terms of carrier Ethernet. And you were talking today a lot about uh, software-defined networking, and it sounds like you're very much uh, talking about managing the elements in the network, in the data center, in the storage area. Um, the question I have is, do you see OpenFlow uh, interfacing at the uh, service level? Do you see it being, having a position in the market where um, OpenFlow can be used to help specify and, and explain what type of end-to-end -end carrier Ethernet service is needed. Because what we're seeing in, in the market from the point of view of the MEF is that what used to be carrier Ethernet services just for the enterprise to the service provider is now in the cloud. Uh, our members are talking about using carrier Ethernet services not only uh, from the enterprise to the data center, 
but also even within the data center, service providers specializing in, in connecting between data centers and within the uh, data centers. So do you see OpenFlow interfacing at the service level with, with wide area networks? Yeah, um, the, I think, uh, yeah, uh, definitely uh, OpenFlow can be applied to the uh, meter Ethernet level. And uh, one of the examples is the, uh, please look at the Google presentation last week on, at the Open Networking Summit. That will be available in the web page. And, and the, they are doing uh, multiple data center in, uh, from uh, within the US and Europe and interconnected through the uh, fiber. And uh, they put the OpenFlow uh, edge device in uh, each data center and they interconnect and then do the traffic optimization and QoS type of the guarantee and also traffic engineering. And through that aspect, I think uh, Metro Ethernet um, be a similar uh, type of the function um, in, in the market. The, the, I think uh, the current uh, missing pieces of the uh, open flow is that uh, the, let's say, uh, resiliency in the carrier level like uh, protection switching and also uh, some of the OEM management. And there are a couple of the missing pieces in the standard. standard. But uh, uh, I think we could um, the utilize the Metro Ethernet Forum standard, standard and also ITUT standard to the OpenFlow uh, standard. Then that could be yeah, possible in a metro area, yeah, Ethernet as, as well. Keep, keep it short. Got okay. To, to yeah, I definitely think that the, the carrier use case is a, an emerging and popular one for software-defined networks and open flow. Uh, we're seeing it through a number of public press releases. Another one was um, uh, Verizon with a uh, partnership with HP and others. Uh, so, so these are definitely valid use cases. I think the service provider uh, are trying to find new operational models for deploying their networks. I think they're well used to centralized control planes. They've done this. Um, already, but they tend to be very proprietary, in-house built, and what we're st starting to offer with this new paradigm is a sense of openness, of uh, interaction. Yeah, I think I definitely agree. I, I think you, the kind of use cases you're going to see is um, you know, end of year uh, accounting that needs a bunch of a lot of resources, and you may have that in a different location. So you, you know you, you're going to have to move your VMs. You're going to have to move. Uh, all of your resources to a different location, and, and that's where the interconnects between the data centers uh, and the enterprise will definitely have to be orchestrated. Okay, question down here. Uh, while that microphone's coming to you, let me, let me ask one question that I'm quite in intrigued to know. You've got all these packets flowing around. Um, the control plane is sort of somewhere other than where the packets are flowing. Um, what happens to security in this scenario? You know, I've got, you know, I'm a best of breed kind of guy. I've got, I've got my sort of security appliance that examines every packet in minute detail um, for good reason. What happens? How does that work? Okay. The, even the security can be uh, managed in a centralized way. The, the uh, current uh, router needs a uh, policy or security uh, configuration for each device, right? But because of the centralized control, you can have a single policy or single security management in a s single location, then that is reflected to the each device. Therefore, it is easy to manage. That is a security. So forget my security appliance. You do it all at the, you know, I, I don't need that anymore. Mm -hmm. I can put it all into, the, all into the software. Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, the security policy, policy can be centralized. And then that device is, uh, that configuration is downloaded to the each device. Okay. Therefore, definitely we need a device in hardware but the configuration can be centralized. Okay, so, so the software ensures that those packets get routed through the whatever best right, right, security from device I, I want to use. Okay, right, got right. it. Thank that, you. I definitely agree. The hardest part about security is getting the policy right, and the policy cannot be compromised in security. Yeah, it has to be accurate. I, yeah, and I certainly don't want to change that. That's right. And so by, as, as we mentioned here, by centralizing the policy management and security, it, inc it increases the correctness of the deployment of it. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. There's nothing to add. It's, it's the orchestration. It's okay. the policy at that high level um, that, that needs to be done, that orchestration. Got it. Thank you. Sorry, question. Good morning, gentlemen. I'm CEO of Nanotel. Uh, Nanotel is a new entrant in India, and we are actually from the United States. My question is, 
We are actually in the telcos. Uh, in India, you have uh, close to 10 telcos, and you have 900 million subscribers. And the, all database of those subscribers are on the conventional data centers. We are trying to open a vertical in our organization, which is uh, cloud sharing. So uh, in your all discussions, uh, I couldn't be able to find that down the line, how the cloud sharing model would be looking like. Like if you see uh, in telcos, you have uh, Nokia Siemens equipment, you have Ericsson, you have Huawei, you have ZTE. So like 10 years ago, people don't used to share the networks. Now everybody shares the network, either it's a passive network or as an active network because of the cost. So what is the roadmap do you see that uh, telcos are start sharing the cloud? This is my question. Okay, I'll start. Um, again, you know, I think it revolves around this ability to centralize the control plane of the network equipment. And when you have a shared infrastructure, you now have to have a federation of systems that come together to implement the, um, the peering relationships. And so, so through the use of the central systems, the APIs, the standardization, I think this starts to enable that type of um, federation. Yeah, the multi, what you're basically talking about is multi-tenancy and, and allowing for people to share not just the bandwidth, but also the servers and storage and all. And the, and the multi-tenancy virtualization is part of that overall orchestration. And we definitely see that as one of the key reasons for not only I mean, for the SDN world um, and the rules developed underneath that. Okay. So in, yeah. In addition to that, uh, the sharing the network devices would be come from uh, the uh, VNO virtual network operator and also a multi-tenancy, and those uh, completely require the uh, SLA and uh, QoS isolation for the each network equipment in uh, multiple switches environment. Therefore, we have to make sure that everything works for end-to-end -end requirement and end-to-end -end the virtual VNO type of the then that'd be, that'd be yeah, possible, but yeah, it, it, it still needs time to complete it. Okay, question, another, any more questions? Uh, well, I, I have a question, um, and it's about the governance of, the whole, of the whole, this whole SDN. Uh, at the moment, the way things work generally is, as those of us with the experience of the industry is, you have a governing body and it, and it kind of starts off this whole thing and that's kind of the stage we're at, and it, everyone's involved in that. Um, and then there comes a point where you say, okay, that's done, um, and we hand it over to the industry, and the industry, and it becomes de facto standards rather than a governing body type thing. Um, how far down the road are we towards that? And, and is that the kind of the model you have in your heads for how SDN is going to be managed, if you like, the standard side of it, if you like? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, the open flow aspects are coming from the Open Networking right. Foundation. Um, where the, also other APIs that we've mentioned, north side um, controller interfaces are starting to be proposed. Um, you're right in that these, these are coming out of a consortium of companies that are trying to provide a degree of openness. And so I think it's in the, the delivery and interoperation of these open systems that uh, self governs the delivery. I, I see a few points here. First of all, you have to understand that the, the the open flow and the SDN, this is really a 1.0, so we still have a lot of development to do. There's still a lot of aspects of this, but it is a change in the, in the data center. Uh, what, once it becomes a commercial, then it becomes the value add, and that is the differentiator, it's gonna become the value add, but it has to be at the API level still open, but above that, what services or what do I as a, as a vendor provide? That's the differentiator, and that's why, as commercial companies, we get involved. Uh, but it is, does have to be open. Yeah, in, in addition to that, uh, there are a couple of the, uh, the API, like open flow interface between the control switch, uh, that is being standard at ONF, and northbound API to talk to a uh, um, VM or management system. And in addition to that, the after those devices will be available in a commercial market, then next thing is the requirement is the internal, I don't know, internal API, meaning that the third party can provide application to the control vendor, for example, then integrate the solution. That is another third step, like the first one is the open flow interface, then northbound API to 
do the orchestration system. Then third one is the kind of like Android type of the application development SDK, and everybody can write the code for any vendor environment. That is the full ecosystem. Yeah, that's, that's the eventual final That's, that's interesting, so there's a lot of opportunities for third parties in this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We, we have an ecosystem part of it. I mean, we provide uh, a product called Crowbar for doing cloud uh, configuration and all, and we have partnerships in that. Uh, and, and all of our, the whole ecosystem, uh, we don't do it. We partner uh, with people like Big Data, uh, sorry, Big Switch, uh, NEC has products that, um, that help us. So there are a lot of, um, but th we may get into a data center where somebody has an HP and they want to bring in a Dell how does that all work together? And, and that's what people are asking. Well, that's what customers are asking for. Whereas the old days, it was I could buy a particular vendor and I couldn't get fired. And that, that is changing now because the, it's a financial, it's a, it, uh, there's a lot more involved now. Okay. Mark, final words? No, I, I think we need to think about the degree of openness from the device layer through the controller layer and through the end-to-end -end solutions that ultimately the what we call the enterprise grade solution needs to fulfill uh, the complete tested, the support processes, all those things come together in the ecosystem. Okay, Mark, Bruce, Bruce Atsushi, thank you very much indeed for your contributions. Um, fascinating debate and this will go on. I expect we'll be touching on this in future net events, so uh, do please come again. Um, this, is not the end of the, 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 this is not the end of the event, but do think about this, do come again, because this one will run run and run, that's for sure. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Manny. Thank you very much.